In the last lecture, we talked about a lot of the settings that are required when you're actually taking photos, whether that's through a smartphone or a digital single lens reflex camera or a point and shoot camera, things like aperture, ISO and shutter speed, as well as lighting and, and taking your time and composition and all those kinds of things really matter when you're actually taking the photo. But once you're done taking the photos, it's important to understand what you're gonna use the photo for and uh, understanding how we're going to edit and optimize these photos. So the first thing I wanna talk about with digital photography is pixel. It literally stands for picture element. Think of them as the atoms that make up your image. I'm sure you've seen images like this Chrome browser logo that are really what they call pixelated. It means that you can see all the specific pixels that make up that image. Once you have taken a photo, it has a certain number of pixels, uh, depending on how good of a camera it was or how many pixels it could pick up. And those are really what you have to work with when you're editing your photos. I'm sure you've heard the term megapixel. Well, that just stands for one million pixels. So if a camera had a 12 megapixel camera, it means that it can only allow for a max of 12 million pixels with every shot. And so it's important to understand pixels because the number of pixels in your image will determine the size of your file. Um, if it was taken with 12 megapixels, that's a lot of data and it may take up a lot of space on your SD card or on your smartphone. Um, it'll also depend on the quality of your image um, because again, you can't go back and retake the photo once it's done. You can't add more pixels to it. You could, but it really won't improve the quality by adding more pixels. Um, because it's really got that number of pixels to work with. Most of the time when we look at things like a printed billboard or you know even a digital image that you might find, you might see the pixels at work. And that's always a bad thing. You really don't wanna see all the pixels. You wanna see the image sharp and clear. But you also have to understand where these images are going to know how to optimize it for the medium that you're trying to put the image onto. So maybe you've been on a website and you've tried to upload an image, but it was too big. Well, that website only allows for certain file sizes and it might have too many pixels in the image and it won't allow you to upload it. Same with if you're going to a website and it's taking forever to load, or if you've uploaded a bunch of photos from your SD card onto Facebook and it's taking forever, well, that's because there's so many pixels that it's trying to optimize for their servers and make it run faster. And so that's a big question you have to ask yourself, where will this image end up? There's really one of two places it will end up, in a digital format, like on a website or in an app or something, or it'll end up in a physical format where it's printed, like on a brochure or a card or something like that. So we're gonna focus mostly on the digital side of things, but you do have to think about where this digital image will go. So first we're gonna talk about print resolution. Print resolution is measured in DPI, dots per inch. What number of dots every inch can this printer actually print? And it's basically up to the capabilities of that printer. Um, a general standard for most printers is that all printers will print 300 dots per inch. So every inch that you physically see, there's gonna be 300 dots within that inch and that's what a printer can print. So if you're on a brochure and you want to print that high quality of images and colors, then you're gonna want a, an image that has lots and lots of pixels because you're going to need that high volume of pixels to make it a very high quality image. When we talk about screen resolution, however, um, now that is talking about the number of pixels in each dimension, width and height, that can be displayed on a screen or a monitor. So it can take that same in image and display it width and height on an actual monitor. And there are lots of different screen resolutions that you might see, some for small monitors or larger monitors, and basically it's describing the number of pixels width by height that it can display, all the way up to 4K, even 8K TVs that you might see at Best Buy that are huge, that have you know thousands of pixels wide by thousands of pixels tall, and it can display really high quality images. But also you have to think about pixel density. How many pixels are packed into the physical space that we see? So pixel density is the number of pixels every inch that can be displayed within the actual size of the monitor or display. So similar to the printer density of when you're trying to print per dot, dots per inch, 
What we have instead for a monitor will be pixels per inch. So every physical inch of the monitor can display anywhere from 72 pixels uh, to even up to a few hundred. So the standard for pixels on a digital screen is anywhere from 72 to 120 pixels per inch. So when you're looking at a digital monitor, I don't know if you've ever noticed that when you um, have a really old school monitor, it looks like a grid and it looks really poor quality. But when you look at a retina screen display, you can see those curved edges. You can't see the pixels nearly as much at all. Well, because there's such a deep pixel density on a retina screen display or an ultra high definition display, they're packed in so tightly that it mimics kind of a printed product. And so you, you don't see all those pixels, all those pixelated images or anything like that. And so it can pack a lot more into a retina screen display than it can with an old school display. So for an example, an old monitor would really only display 72 pixels per inch. That was pretty much a standard in the 80s and 90s. Um, every inch of the monitor provided 72 pixels that it could display. On a more recent iMac, they can actually display 220 pixels every inch. And even on your phones have become quite good quality in that it's allowing for under over 458 pixels for every inch. And what we're going to do is kind of take a look at an image that I took. You can see when you open it in a image editor, it will tell you of the actual photo that you have, how many pixels wide and how many pixels tall do you have? And at what resolution is it displaying this image? So when we look at the number of pixels in that image, there's 4,000 pixels by 3,000 pixels, and that gives me a 12 megapixel image, or 12 million pixels in this image. Now those numbers don't change. That's the number of pixels that are, was taken in this photo when I took it. Now if I were to put this on an old school monitor that was 14 inches by 10 inches, and that monitor could only display 72 pixels for every inch that it has, it would only allow me to display 1,000 pixels by 768, 1024 by 768. That's the number of pixels that this monitor can display. This can only display 700,000, almost 800,000 pixels. That's not even one megapixel, but yet I have a 12 megapixel image. That's a big difference. What that's going to display is only the top corner of the night sky of the image. You can imagine what's not being shown here. It's, it's not able to display even one twelfth of the image that I have. It's going to be way too big for that monitor. Do we need files that big for the web? The answer is no. We really don't need files that big for old school, especially an old school monitor. It's kind of like fitting a really big cat into a small box. It just does not work. Even on an iMac, if you were to put that same image on a, on a large iMac, you'd see more of the image, but it's still not nearly small enough to fit the entire screen. If I were to put it on a phone, a small phone, it would be good quality size, but still we could do a lot to make this image a lot smaller. So it's important to take our large images and downsize them for the web. Now, if you were gonna print this on a brochure, then you would not really wanna downsize it a whole lot because you need those really high uh, resolution for the printer. But if we were doing it for the web, we really want to downgrade it because most of the time our images are gonna be seen on computer monitors and devices. So when we're talking about image optimization, it's basically taking the original image and resizing it so that it will fit on a digital device. Okay, so step one of optimizing an image is change the image resolution to about 72 to 120. So if you take a really big photo and uh, it has a resolution of 300, you're going to want to first change that down to about 72 because that's what most monitors can display anyway. The next thing that you should do is resize the width and the height. Change the image width or height to about a thousand pixels wide to about 750 tall or whatever you're trying to, it'll, it'll snap depending on the uh, program that you're using to edit this image. 
And you can see just by doing those two things, our image was 12 megabytes large and now it's only two megabytes. So we've already made it six times smaller by doing those two things, by changing the resolution to 300 and by changing the width and the height a little bit. Um, it's gonna still be a good quality image for the web and it will be a lot smaller and it will move a lot faster. And then we're gonna want to save this image as a web safe file name. And there are just a few file names that I want you to be familiar with because that's what you're going to be sending and receiving and putting on websites and maybe putting um, in emails and you're probably somewhat familiar with them anyway. But I want you to know JPEGs, GIFs, and PNGs. That's JPG, GIF, and PNGs. And so when you're saving your image, these are the three that you're probably going to see most often. GIFs or GIFs, I call them GIFs, are stand for graphics interchange format. And these are pretty popular in that they are good at optimizing a photo and remembering areas of color. So instead of having to remember every single pixel of your image, when it saves it, it saves it somewhat like a vector image and it will remember coordinates. It'll remember that this area was blue, this area was red, this area was yellow. Instead of remembering every single white pixel, every single blue pixel, it will remember these as shapes and they're always good for big solid areas of color. So anytime you see a cartoon or an image that has lots of solid colors, it's going to remember it easier and be better optimized um, and smaller of a file size if it's saved as a GIF or a GIF. Now, these images are lossless, and that what that means is when it's saved as a GIF or a GIF, it can remember those vector coordinates, so you could make it as large as a bus, or you could make it as small as a tiny logo, and as long as you have those vector coordinates, it can be huge and tiny, and it will remember them as a math equation, and you won't really have much of a loss, you won't have any loss of the original image, so they are lossless. They also allow for animations. Obviously, we all know GIFs as moving images, animated GIFs. Uh, that's one really great quality about GIFs. You can't do that with other file formats. Um, they allow for transparent backgrounds. So if you have a logo that uh, you wanted to overlay on top of another image, you can do that with a GIF. And then it's great for logos and areas of uh, constant color. Uh, a similar file type is a ping, and most people will use PNGs instead of GIFs because it's kind of like a GIF 2.0. It's even a smaller file size, and it can remember more and even better high, higher quality image. So you're probably going to more likely see a ping than a GIF. Uh, it's a very similar file type, but it's also saved as a vector, and it's also a lossless file. So you're going to see those quite a bit. Now then you have JPEGs, JPEGs or JPGs, and that stands for Joint Photographic Experts Group. Uh, this is a way to compress a file where it will remember your uh, pixels, but it will remove some pixels and rem remember it in a way that web browsers can read it, but still be a small file size. Uh, JPEGs are lossy, and what that means is it takes those pixels and it removes them. And that means that if you save it as a JPEG, you can't go back to the original file anymore, and it will lose pixels. It will lose quality. And so it's a risk whenever you save it as a JPEG. Uh, best for saving photographic images, like I said earlier, it's, and most of the time when you take a photo with your iPhone, it's going to default to being saved as a JPEG. It might be a JPG or a JPEG, depending on how it was saved, but either one, it's gonna be a JPEG. So when we see something like the Snapchat logo, it would be best saved as a GIF or a ping because there's lots of areas of constant color. This one, because it has lots of depth, lots of gradients, and it was actually taken by a camera, that would be best saved as a JPEG. Now, we have a logo like this, NBC, where it's got both solid colors and then it's got some gradients in it as well. This would probably be best saved as a GIF or a ping, but because there's the gradients, it might be also better saved as a JPEG. You don't know sometimes until you start looking at the file sizes. And when you're, especially when you're dealing with logos that are really tiny anyway, it's not gonna make that big of a difference. But when we're trying to save this image, like this, for example, this one that I took on this football field, you don't wanna overwrite your original image, you may need it. 
So when you're taking a photo like this, you're gonna to wanna to save it as a JPEG, but I won't wanna overwrite the original photo because I might need all those pixels later. Because JPEGs are lossy, it's gonna lose some quality. So instead of saving it, I wanna save as. And so the goal here is that you learn how to take photos and then manipulate them, edit them, optimize them for the way that your audience will be consuming them, whether that's through a print product or most likely through a digital product. And so take these skills and concepts and experiment this week. Take some photos, uh, maybe relating to your blog project, and think about ways that you might tell a story using photography and just experiment and create.